know you do something to do with marketing and innovation all that stuff what did you start out as when you first started put out yeah yeah uh i don't know how far back do you want me to go i uh i uh i was an economics major in school in in college university um but i minored in english and i had chosen economics because it was the fewest required number of units so that was it was just so i could take i could take everything else so i did you know, I kind of went for that old school, classic liberal arts education where I, it wasn't in order to get a job. It was just yeah. in order to study and learn. So coming out of college, I, I worked for a couple of small consulting firms for a while. And then I dropped out and tried to write a novel and that didn't go very well. <laughs> I mean, I wrote it, but it was pretty bad. <laughs> and then, um, and then I, uh, I took some time touring around the country then went back to work and then I ended up in the, like, I started in IT really. So I, back in the day, which is aging me is, you know, uh, personal computers and networking and all yeah. that kind of stuff was just really getting going inside of businesses. So they needed somebody to take care of that stuff. And, yeah. and I was a little bit savvy. And so I was the guy that took care of computers and, uh, and so I was the IT manager for a couple of firms, you know, sort of got oh, yeah. bigger companies and then joined in the late 90s and 97, joined a startup as IT manager. And inside of that company, Tumbleweed, I was IT and then I was ahead of the professional services group that was implementing the product. And then, <laughs> uh, and then, you know, left them and, and started a company with this other guy and did a lot of product management and business development. That company failed. So then I joined another company with that founder, with my partner is, and ran their product management. So they didn't have any product management and Silicon Valley, this was early 2000s then. Product management was, I mean, it, it was, existing but it was it was relatively new so that's like early 2000s product management as its own function was kind of newish and and it's only now i think reaching some sort of a tipping point where product management often is sort of the ceo of the product and is touches everybody in the company and it just mm -hmm. increased you know like really be, has become a, a super vital role so I have a soft spot for product managers because I just, I think it's, it's a, just a great, it's great. It's a great position to be in if you're just trying to expand your career. And I think, ironically, I think that my classic liberal arts education, which was broad based chemistry, calculus, mm. English, sociology, psychology, you know, I think that mixture is actually perfect for a product manager who has to work with absolutely everybody inside the company and on the one hand, must undergo understand customers, and on the other hand, actually be yeah. able to communicate with yeah. techni highly technical people and engineers and all the rest. Um, so I had no idea that that's, you know, a job was going to emerge that actually sort of matched those skills. Um, so that's that's sort of where I started out and ended up running marketing and and sales and business development yeah. and, and those type of things, as well as kind of I moved up the stack. But the, yeah, I don't know. I mean, so even my even my career does not have some sort of, you know, singular path. But is, I, think, that, I find that really interesting because I do a lot of timelines with people and, and often those patterns through life are these different things and the more flexible and the more maverick, if you like, <laughs> or sort of try it all out type thing are people that are better able to manage as entrepreneurs and as and going it on their own because they can sort of talk to everybody and they they can take the knocks and they can sort of pivot quickly all the things so i love yeah, that I idea. Think good, yeah i think that's a good observation i mean i think i for ages and ages just i was like yeah no i'm not really an entrepreneur and the reason was because i didn't feel like i had any ideas and then you kind of realize later that that's the easiest part of the whole thing. Oh, I, yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's like too many things underneath the sun to even go and tackle. And I, I think that the, 
So I think it's interesting to be able to look backwards and go like, well, actually there is sort of this string that runs yeah. through the whole thing. Yeah. And I also think um, people make the mistake about what they're natural at and what they're passionate at. And that's all great. Um, but you actually do have to shore up some of the places where you're a little bit weak too. And it doesn't mean like concentrate on those. I totally think you should double down on what you're good at. Yeah. Um, but going and exploring and understanding some of those other things allows you to have intelligent conversations about them. And again, I think what you're saying is, you know, it's important for an entrepreneur to be able to do that. And it's, again, it's not that they have to have the deep technical yes. level expertise at any of that, mm -hmm. but they just have to be able to have intelligent conversations around it. So having been exposed to it is, uh, is a good thing. I think, for me, when we talk about innovation, and, and I, I, I laugh the whole word innovation, as you know. Really, I hate it, but anyway, go ahead. One of those words. <laughs> but there's something in there about if you don't have some grounding of something, just a basic understanding, you don't understand what's new or what's already been done. So you could just say that go round around in circles with the same thing. And you talk about experiments a lot. You're always talking about experiment and, and yeah. try things and all the rest of it. And I can't help think of that's because people who can take risk in their lives who have gone, oh, I'm going to go and travel or I've, I've had enough of that, I'm going to go off and do the amount of times I put keys on a desk where a job I paid you to go, no, I can't do this anymore, I'm off. <laughs> people there, I think, is just easier to look at it and not get frozen by the fear. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think that, well, there's kind of two things to that. One is, I think that uh, it's super empowering to get to a point in your life where you have enough, I guess, faith in yourself that you can walk away from anything, right? The power of walking away <laughs> is like one of the most extraordinary powers in yeah. the world yeah and yeah. actually in in all sorts of circumstances right i mean salespeople sort of know this intuitively right because they're going to get to the point where the person says yes or no yeah. <laughs> or else they're wasting their time yeah, move on. right <laughs> right and so in that way rejection actually is a good thing yeah. it's like it's not the best it's second best okay. right i mean <laughs> Best is I love you. Yes, I want you. Oh, Second dead. best is I never want to see you again, right? Third best is <laughs> that's the worst, right? So, and, and again, like in conflict, I think it's the same thing. It's like being able to walk away is actually the most empowering yeah. part of like any confrontation yeah. even. Yeah. Um, and it just is a... It, it's, I think so. I think that that's part of what you're getting at in terms of the risk. Um, and I guess I learned that for whatever reason, I think I learned that fairly easily. And so suddenly people don't have something over you. If they, if they feel like, and this is a customer, this is a boss, this is a politician here in the US, it's even a policeman, maybe. I don't know. But it's, if you can't, if they know you can't, walk away that's power you've just yes. needed all sorts of power yes yes the second part of that risk thing though that i think is interesting i think really great entrepreneurs and i do not include myself in that class but really great entrepreneurs are risk averse and and so it's not that they like risk or that they are attracted by risk it's that they actually take steps to mitigate risk so they lower yes. the uncertainty yes. so what's What's crazy about, and I love this dichotomy because I think we sit there and go, oh yeah, you know, people inside the big companies, they, uh, they're all risk averse. And you're all like, no, I mean, <laughs> shit's going to fail if you don't change. And you're all just like going, no, everything's like you do it. You're like ignoring the risk, yeah, you're yeah, ignoring yeah. the uncertainty. Yeah. Whereas really the good entrepreneurs are actually very disciplined about breaking down where's the uncertainty that's going to maybe cause me to fail and how do I go mitigate that risk? But you don't like the word fail. Uh, well, no, I mean, I, I'm fine with the word fail. I just think it means fail small, not fail big. So no, yeah. I don't, I don't like the, the concept of failing big, right? Yeah. So 
anybody that uses the fail terms, fail fast, or, you know, or accept failure, or, oh, you know, can you come in and help us fix our culture of being afraid of failing? And I'm all like, well, I don't really want you to fail <laughs> big. And so I really, I always feel like I have to explain it now because I, I think that it's, I think that I'm beating my head against the wall if I have to go in and talk to senior people and tell them that you got to, you really got to learn how to fail. And, <laughs> and it's, it's just not going to, it's, that's a harder road to hoe. I mean, it's really about failing small, yeah. early, yeah. fast, yeah. so you don't fail big. Yeah. It's really, it's really learning. But that's a cultural thing, I, I think, because I think the states have more, um, they're more accepting of people that get it wrong rather than get it wrong and then try again and try again and try oh, again. Whereas that's why we left. That's why we left Europe, right? Yeah. Is we got it all wrong. So <laughs> yeah, that's great. get it wrong once, that's it. You've had it. You must just go and bury yourself. You're not coming back. Well, you know what's funny is I people are like uh, people always say that. Oh well, it's the U.S. And then in the U.S., everybody goes like, Oh well, you're from California. And then if you're in California, <laughs> people go like, Oh well, you know, you're from oh, it's right down Silicon Valley States. or whatever. So. <laughs> I love that. So really, it's it's pretty universal. I actually don't think. Uh, I mean, I do think the U.S. is a bit more entrepreneurial than other places for sure. Um, but you know, you walk into any of our big corps here, there's no there's no like, hey, come on in, we accept failure. I mean, that's not not, not what's going on here. It all comes down to the wording. Yeah, it does. So if we go forward, then so we've got at the moment. We've got a lot of companies going to have to face <laughs> challenge of possible small failure and big failure after the shutdown. And I know yeah. I'm pretty, you know, people go, it's bad now, but I keep thinking, actually, you have no idea how bad it's going to get because I don't know how it works in the States, but we furloughed. 75% of our workforce are furloughed and paid by the government. And, and I look at it and I go, but when that ends, and the companies have to be finding the money to pay their staff, but they haven't actually. That's going to, because there's then going to be some big or small failures. So moving forward, do you think then that whole risk thing is something we're going to have to really grab the hold of uh, uh, to do something different to, to pull people in? Yeah, I, didn't, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I think that I, I don't know exactly what the situation is like sort of a more macro situation yeah. in, in Europe or in, in the UK, but uh, you know, I think that, I think that we've lost the ability generally to go figure out how to create new value for human beings. And so I think that this is where the companies are in trouble. And it's also why, I hate the word innovation because yeah. everybody is running around talking about innovation and the, the, you know, digital transformation and new technology. And they're focused on technology, technology, technology. Yeah. And I'm all like, no, humans, humans, humans. Yeah. And, and, uh, and here in the States, especially, you know, we don't do any antitrust anymore. We've allowed private equity to go buy all these companies and then they squeeze all of these companies down. Right. So that's called sort of the financialization of capitalism here is basically all of these companies have become products themselves as opposed to, hey, I'm going to go invest long term in this company yeah, because yeah, yeah. they're creating value and they're going to create value. That means they're going to make money and their stock price will go up and yeah, yay, I'll, I'll yeah. share in some benefit. No, now it's instead it's like, OK, we're going to come in here. We're going to strip you down. We're going to flip you. We're going to try to make money. Right. So it's all about this wealth creation instead of mm -hmm. value creation. Mm -hmm. And so. So if you look at the world that way, and then boom, we're in this pandemic. Yeah. And all these companies have to figure out how to crawl out of it. Well, all of that companies as a financial product doesn't work anymore, right? Because there's no, there's no economic activity going on. And so, I mean, I've been preaching this for years because I think it's the problem with the whole innovation game as well. It's like, you can't just go and do technology for technology's sake. You have to get back out and understand your customers and go create value for them. And then that's how we create companies that are successful. Yeah. I mean, that is actually what startups do. You can't create a startup that's just based on fluff. 
they end up failing. And even though the investors are trying to flip the shares and maybe the investors make out, the human yeah. beings inside the company and the customers do not benefit. And so then that's, <laughs> just, that's terribly wasteful. And so the thing is, is that the pandemic has just driven this point home because here we are, lack of economic activity, human beings in a great deal of need mm -hmm. and companies that don't know how to, they don't know how to bridge that. Right. Yeah. And so, I mean, there's a lot of people inside these companies that do, and yeah. it's great. And so, you know, uh, tons of leadership training going on that's teaching vulnerability and empathy and all these type of things and design thinking people inside of these companies that are, that are teaching companies how to go and do user experience. You know, I'm not a big fan of the Google design sprints, but the fact that they're actually out there and people are showing stuff to customers, at least and then there's tons of customer experience. So it's, I don't want to like overstate the fact that we're not talking to our customers. Um, but it just, the, the cultures of the companies themselves have to stop paying the lip service to customer service or customer centric. And they have to structure their companies, restructure their companies based upon going out, discovering and creating value for human beings. And mm. that's actually what's going to turn, turn yeah. those companies around. And so for the entrepreneurs, it's the same thing. Yeah. And a matter of fact, this is an opportunity for them because frankly, the small companies, the startups, the solo entrepreneurs, they can get out there and talk to customers. It's what we have to do, isn't it? To survive, right. you know, I have to yeah. talk to people because I don't right. have a budget. So maybe yep. the smaller businesses and the entrepreneur, you know, the small solo people, and those like me with a lot of fluff, can <laughs> actually, sort of take a bit of that pie that you know wasn't available because we were they got to hustle yeah but they got to hustle <laughs> and you know oh, so you just have to hustle <laughs> well i mean a lot of those entrepreneurs these days you know clickety clackety behind their computer screen and of course with you know with covid it's yeah. hard to go and communicate with customers but videos and all of these other type oh. of things you have to get out there and do it yeah um and it's not just sitting inside your your uh, your home office trying to imagine what it is to be a customer. And so, yeah, it's challenging, but I mean that that's where opportunity exists. Yeah. yeah. Right. That I brick wall that. behind you. I don't know if it's a real brick wall, but I mean that's actually where the t the the big wins are. Is like breaking you know breaking through the tough walls. Right. If it was easy, then it would have already been done. So you actually. Oh, bad. You're gonna break the brick wall. <laughs> And some of it is about breaking down those things that I find difficult or I have found difficult. Go, well, you can't afford to find it difficult anymore. You've got to yeah. find your way through it. And it's so noisy online. And, and I, I zoomed out and any more yeah. and any more five day this and five day that. And then I find myself in the online thing going, oh, I have no idea what I'm doing, <laughs> what they're yeah. talking about. Yeah. I think there's... Um, that there's a, a chance here for people to sort of literally step up and go, like you said, what is the value? What do my real customers want? What can I give them? And I can still pick up a phone. I don't actually have to be online. I can pick the, the what? The what? The, yeah, there what are. is that? You can just... <laughs> <laughs> talk to people. <laughs> one to one. Great stuff. So I think there's a way forward. So how do you see this all unraveling? And I, you said to me a while back, girls going, oh, the new, the new, new people will have learned. And you cynically went, no, they said that. <laughs> it's not going to change. You still think it's not going to change? You know, I don't know. I, uh, I mean, Man, we've just gone from one crisis to another over here, and yeah. Uh, yeah. well, the world has the whole sort of race race thing going on at the moment. It's. I think. No, I mean, I'm, I'm hopeful that we're maybe that, that we maybe get to the tipping point this time. I mean, I think that uh, I th you know it's really extraordinary if you look at. Uh, I mean, not to get all political here, but if you look at at gay rights, yeah, the gap between when the US passed anti-gay marriage stuff to when the, that issue went 100% away 
yeah. is so extraordinarily short, right? It was like between 2008 and then yeah. by 2012, it's like, nope, we totally reversed it and every, the world didn't end and everybody's good with it. So yeah. I, it's, when the tipping point comes, it's just, it changes so fast. And yeah. I think that I see this everywhere. So I think it's with uh, Black Lives Matter and I think it's with a lot of women's rights and yeah. I just, we're getting closer and closer to that tipping point and, I, and you know, always the old guard. And this is the same thing as about as disruption that we talk about with respect to innovation. It's yeah. the exact same phenomena. The old guard is not going to recognize the change. They're going to resist it to the very end. And then when it's toppled, it's done. Yeah. Yeah. So. That sounds like a great play. I mean, I, I, like you, I do think we're heading that way. And, and it's almost like, and this is me getting a bit spiritual, it's almost like the universe went, well, COVID wasn't quite enough. Let's add something else on there and make people rethink. And yeah. It just comes in waves, I think. Yeah. I, so my analogy in my mind, it's always like, you know, the, the ripple, you know, or, or waves or whatever. And, you know, uh, a lot of it has to do, unfortunately, it takes a long time because of, of generations, I think. And so you'll have one generation and the wave comes and it, you know, crashes up against yeah. the old guard and then it recedes back. And then another wave comes and it's a little bit bigger. And finally, the wave comes that yeah. that uh, that knocks that shit down, and and I think that it's. Uh, I just I hope we're I hope we're there. That sounds like a great surfer analogy. Have you ever surfed? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah. Well, maybe. I can you now. You know, California hippie days, traveling. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, yeah. <laughs> well, that was great. So you've got your new book coming out. When's that due out? The new book. Well, so I've got I've got the second version of my first book that's coming out. You know, probably within the month. Uh, people can go to startupbluebook.com now and and be notified when it's released. Um, and basically, it's it's it teaches some of those principles about how to get out and talk to the customers and how to run those experiments that yeah. you mentioned and, yeah. uh, and a guide to other resources and that sort of thing. Uh, I look forward to that. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, I, I enjoyed your book. I'm not a great lover of some industry books, but I did enjoy yours. I have well, to say you. I understood most of it and I'm hoping the next one I'll understand even more. Yeah. I'm hoping this one's actually even easier. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I did not spend my life running around the country. I spent most of my life just getting divorced. So <laughs> 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 well, just think of those as experiments too. They yeah. were, absolutely. <laughs> just experimenting on what I needed most. Thanks, Brad.